All right, so I'm recording the session so we can kind of uh, review it uh, later. Okay, so let's start with some uh, fundamentals. Um, networking requires some infrastructure and networking requires some setup. So to talk about the infrastructure and to talk about the, the setup, it's kind of good to use the notion that we have, um, yeah, let me do full screen, uh, that we have from the normal networking, um, which you have already uh, learned about. And the, the best way to use when discussing networking and networking infrastructure is to use the OSI uh, layered model. Uh, <clears throat> why we do this? Well, we usually do some sort of layered architecture or modular architecture when we want to deal with complexity and we want to isolate a complexity of a particular sub-module from other modules. And we have uh, usually um, uh, module modules isolated by some clear API or some clear protocol, right? So <clears throat> we usually have um, a notion of, I basically need to uh, wave my hands a little bit. So we have um, the concept of the module and then another module or a layer and another layer and we have kind of a um, uh, something in between, which is either an API, like an application um, programming interface, or a protocol. What is the difference between two modules and something in between being an API or being a protocol? What is the difference between API and protocol? Can, um, can you think of, of something? that differentiates, how would you differentiate um, a protocol from a, an API? So I will add a new slide. Anyone? You can Google it. What's the difference between a protocol and API? What are the characteristics? Or intuitively, what, what do you feel uh, is the difference? So we have modules or layers, and then in between, we have something APIs or protocols. which allow the modules or layers to talk to each other, right? Uh, so if we have some uh, microservice architecture where we have some modules or services, uh, so we put say services, um, then we have some API which those services uh, expose such that other services can use them. Uh, but you can also do that through protocols, right? Um, so what, what is the difference? What are the key differences? No one wants to talk? 
Um, so there is not much of a difference, uh, really. Um, we often talk about networking protocols, but we also often talk about networking APIs. Um, it's, it's basically what is in between, but we define it slightly dif with slightly different focus, right? So when we talk about APIs, we usually have uh, services or we have modules, um, we have um, libraries and so on, which expose functionality through an API, right? So when I have a microservice architecture, I have those microservices um, and each microservice, um, okay, uh, exposes some API to it. And then other services can use this API to talk or communicate with, with this microservice. If I have a library, the library exposes an, a, a, an API, right? So when we talk about APIs, we usually talk about those uh, things first. Right, so we say we have OpenCV library, which exposes a particular set of APIs to be um, used by other um, modules or libraries or whatever that is. When we talk about protocols, on the other hand, then the primary thing is the protocol itself, right? So we define a way of communicating. So the primary thing is a way of formatting or communicating or presenting something. And then we have libraries, modules, you know, microservices using it, right? So the, um, when we want something open, we want something to communicate, like for example, HTTP is a defined protocol and we don't talk about web servers and web browsers and you know, Chrome and so on. First, first we talk about HTTP. So the protocol is the primary uh, glue and then everything else is built around it. So everyone else conforms to the protocol and then communication and some things happen. When we talk about the APIs, we turn the things around. So for example, a web browsers can have API, which you can use to program your plugins, right? Then we talk about an API being exposed by the web browser, but the web browser is the primary thing. Uh, when we talk about protocols, the protocol itself is the primary thing and everything else comes later. So first we de designed and we defined through RFCs, the HTTP protocol, and then web browsers and web clients and web servers came later. And we don't care how they are built. What we care is that they conform to the protocol, right? So in the context of networking, we could talk about network devices and network infrastructure exposing an API or we can talk about protocols which define how the networking actually happens. And we did that, so we did both. Um, so, you know, we have the network layers defined as protocols. Um, so we don't specify them as modules which expose an API, we define them as protocols which everybody conforms to, which makes things, certain things possible, right? So when we want, when you want interoperability, you can expose this interoperability through a, an open API or through an open protocol. Uh, and it, it sort of doesn't really matter. Like they are very close, like they can fulfill the same things, right? So if I have, um, if I already defined a web server and if I already defined um, a, um, a web client, then when they communicate over HTTP, you can almost think HTTP being an API. It has verbs, it has a certain calls, and it has certain parameters, has certain uh, you know options like headers and query parameters. And we often do that, like from Android, 
we often talk to a web server using an API. And this HTTP is completely hidden. It's exposed to us through this API, which drops the HTTP protocol uh, beneath. But from our perspective, it's just an API. But you know, from another perspective, if you turn things around, it is a protocol, right? So this distinction between a protocol and API is a matter of perspective. It's not really um, a matter, matter of perspective. Um, there is nothing fundamentally different between defining an API and defining a protocol. It's just the perspective from where you're looking at it. If you're looking at it from inside and everything else is modules and frameworks which use it, then it kind of is a protocol. But if you, you're looking at it from a particular client perspective or server perspective or browser perspective, then it becomes an API. Some things are kind of much easier to look at from an API point of view and from the module point of view, like, you know, um, the way you write plugins. You wouldn't really look at it from a protocol level. You would kind of look at it from an API level because it makes much more sense. But you could look at it how it is communicated and define kind of a protocol of the calls and responses, uh, how, it is, how it actually works, uh, and then look at it from a protocol level. Uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. So both are important, both are valuable, and we use one or the other to define more complex things. And in terms of networking, we define the network layers um, as a stack, and we defined how they communicate in terms of protocols, right? So we have a physical layer and an example of a protocol which allows us to talk to the physical layer. Um, well, that, that one is a little bit tricky because I'm not an expert actually, uh, but let's say there are some uh, fiber, um, fiber optics um, or um, copper or uh, what else can we have? Um, radio protocols, right? Uh, so there will be some radio protocols that Wi-Fi is using, for example, which will sit on the kind of a physical layer. Um, and those will be defined as protocols. They will not be defined as APIs, they will be defined as protocols. On the data link, what do we have? You can use chat if you want. So what, what is a, a, you know, the most known data link protocol? All, all of you are using every day and all of you know what it is called. So in a normal TCP IP uh, stack, we sometimes call it a, a MAC layer, right? Okay, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit boring to just talking to yourself. So, you know, <laughs> you could, um, you could use the chat or say if you know. Um, so, you know, it's a network card which sits in your, in your device um, and it offers this MAC layer and it has a MAC address. Um, so, address and the, the protocol which is using it is called Ethernet, right? So we have Ethernet and Ethernet 2, which is the new version of Ethernet. And that's the, the kind of the protocol which all devices on the data link layer use, right? So there are some um, protocols which the physical layer is using, and we need to use those protocols to talk to the physical layer. <clears throat> we have some uh, protocols which are which are used by the data link layer, and that's Ethernet. And then on the network layer, okay, anyone? I will ask you in the in the oral exam all of this, right? 
this is fundamental kind of habitual level um, networking. So here an example protocol is TCP or UDP, right? Those are the, uh, the most known examples of protocols uh, on that layer. And then, whoops, sorry, that's transport. As the name suggests, transport, right? Transmission. So T stands for transmission. And on the, um, on the network, we have IP, right? Version four and IP version six. Uh, so those are the, the most well-known uh, network protocols. We had other ones before and we have other ones now. So in some data centers, we don't use the TCP IP stack. We may use some proprietary stack, which is faster. Uh, so each layer adds headers and let, let add some, uh, you know, processing latency. So in some of the data centers used on the fiber optics, we may skip certain things and we may use a different protocols. But we usually have this kind of a seven layers um, stack. And then on the session, well, this session and presentations are a little bit tricky. Um, the application layer is easy. So HTTP, for example, is an application layer protocol which may use some um, encodings for a number of different uh, media, right? So media encodings and MIME um, encodings are kind of in the presentation layer. And then session is to do with cookies and with the sessions like HTTP sessions, right? Um, and different browsers and different clients and different web applications use kind of the, the you know, um, different way of tracking the sessions. But using the HTTP, we have those kind of HTTP sessions and HTTP cookies, and we use the MIME extensions for uh, encoding the, the media types, right? So we have kind of a picture, and each of those is uh, an example of a protocol sitting on that particular layer. Uh, I, not, not, not really sitting in the layer, but how the layer exposes itself to others, right? So what we usually do, we, we start from this kind of bottom. So we use HTTP uh, and use um, HTTP sessions and cookies. And then this is wrapped into the TCP stack, TCP um, building block. And then we use the IP for routing and getting to the actual node and then the, you know, the, um, the end device will get the data frames using ethernet, which are transmitted through some sort of physical media. And then we do this to our, on our end to get to the physical media. And then on the other end, the other device kind of unwraps it on the, on the other side, right? So from the programming point of view, if we want to program some sort of a peer-to-peer -peer system or some sort of um, um, network, we usually operate on the kind of application layer. Um, everything else, everything kind of below that, we, we should turn it around. Usually this is the highest abstraction layer and then we have all the way down to the physical layer. I kind of listed them uh, from physical to the application, but of course you can list it from application down to physical. So when we want to program a um, network application using this stack, if we want to communicate using this protocol, um, you, we usually uh, end up kind of using the, these two, right? And to use these two, uh, we have, so this one is giving us a port or a type of a service, right? And this one is giving us an address, right? Um, these ones don't give us addresses uh, because on that layer, we don't care about addresses anymore. 
uh, we care about addresses. I, I mean, HTTP has sort of using a DNS. It has a concept of address as well, kind of a high level address, which then gets converted into the um, network address. But this address is, is this address. They are kind of the same, right? So we don't really have a new concept of address. We have a concept of URI, um, which is a universal resource identifier or URL, but those use the concept of an address from the lower layers, right? So this is a higher level of addressing, but you know the actual um, uh, server address is from the, from the layer four, from the uh, from the layer three, from the network address. So let's uh, let's make them. Oops. Uh, the, anyway, I don't. Yes, let's start from one. Yeah. So layer three um, on Ethernet, we also have an address, and this is the MAC address, right? So we have this. But anyway, we usually, when we program on application layer, we are reusing the concept of the port from layer four <clears throat> and a concept of address from layer three. Um, and that leads us to sockets, right? <clears throat> so what is socket? Okay, <clears throat> when we pass data, exactly, it's a communication endpoint, thanks. So um, socket is kind of like a communication endpoint which is characterized by an address and a port such that we can feed some digital data into and read some digital data from, right? So sockets are kind of sitting somewhere on top of layer three and four, such that we can use high layer protocols to pass data back and forth. Uh, and this data can be HTTP or it can be another protocol, right? So sockets are the kind of high level protocol agnostic. They don't care what sort of protocols are, are being used on them same as layer four and layer three are kind of uh, application agnostic. They don't care what type of applications are being built on top of them. Uh, they offer the kind of capabilities to, to higher levels, higher level protocols. So a socket is a communication endpoint which has certain uh, characteristics. So I said it's kind of a, um, we can we can actually use it. It's a communication endpoint, and I called those endpoints nodes, right? Um, so it's a simple abstraction for end-to-end -end communication. So sockets are kind of the if you imagine the layer three and four being a pipe. So this is kind of a data pipe uh, with two ends. Then the socket is an ending of the pipe on one end and on the other end, right? So it allows kind of an end-to-end -end communication between uh, nodes and one node acts as a server and other nodes act as clients which can connect to that server. Um, this is not, um, yeah, so, so this is not entirely true really. Um, because the you know this is true right so if we have end to end communication the fact that one node as a, as a server doesn't mean that this offers um this kind of endpoint it is an endpoint but um it, it is a little bit of a cheat, right? So the cheat is that the server, when the client connects to it, actually forks a new end connection such that this end-to-end -end connection can happen while the server is still open for accepting new connections, right? So 
the server works like like a rendezvous point and then a client which has its own socket connects to it and then the server spawns a new socket for this end-to-end -end connection and gives the com uh, communication to that new spawn socket whereas the server socket still is open and awaits new connections so while these two guys now talk in a usually in a separate thread the server socket is still open and can accept connections right so this end-to-end -end connections are uh, happened between sockets but the server socket is a separate special type of sockets which is always open and never really used for anything but opening connections opening sockets right um, so sockets support any paradigm like they are used for anything you want and um, sockets are identified by the port and address that's exactly what we um, discussed before that they operate on layer three and layer four layer three is the address layer four is the port and that's all you need to know um, the difference between a server socket is that this port is usually reused for multiple poking right but it's not really used for the actual communication um, so let's say I have a port 22, right? On my laptop, I have, no, let's say on the server at NTNU, I have a, a, um, an SSH server on port 22. So then my client connects to this port, but if this port was used for communicating, uh, then uh, we would block it and nobody else could open an ssh connection right so what happens is the server starts a new socket with a random port tells me what this port number is and i can talk over ssh with this random port which i initiated by a well-known port 22 but the port 22 is still open and a new connection can come and initiate this kind of a handshake which starts a new socket right um, so many well-known ports are kind of offered um, through this um, server yeah my mouse froze okay through this um, well-known ports such that we can kind of reuse them and a, a very easy way to play with it is uh, netcat or on macos uh, nc which is a shortcut for uh, netcat uh, nc also is uh, a client like in, on uh, linux and other systems so it, it's either called netcat or it's called nc uh, and then telnet is usually called telnet and if you're on any linux like operating system you can kind of play with it easily so here i have a terminal and i will make it a bit bigger and I will open a new terminal, which will make it a bit bigger. I will uh, fire up some fancier shells. All right, so I have two windows and um, Netcat is uh, able to be used in um, server. It can open a server socket or it can open a client socket, right? Uh, telnet is used to open a client socket so for example i can open a telnet um, telnet to yeah i i was demonstrating connecting to a port 25 what is port 25 for oh, it's a one of the well-known ports um, reserved for a particular protocol and port 25 is reserved for SMTP. So if you go to SMT, uh, SMTP, which says, which stands for Simple Mate Transfer Protocol, um, this is um, a protocol which sits um, in the yeah so here we have oh 
ports. So here we says that communication between mail servers generally uh, happens through TCP on port 25. You can have um, um, other ports being used to initiate secure connection. Uh, so we have port uh, 587 and 465, which use more sophisticated uh, security mechanisms and more sophisticated handshakes. Uh, and then the simplest one is port 25. And the protocol basically defines kind of a, the data formats and response, the, the, the query and response types, right? It's exactly like API, what, what API defines. Well, API defines the data, like formats of what can be passed through the methods or functions, and then defines those verbs or those function code names, right? Here we have the same. We have basically, um, you know, server and the client. Client has certain actions and certain parameters which can use, and then the server responds certain things, right? So what we can do is we can, um, I, need to find the window yes so if i connect to the if i connect to the university gateway on port 25 it should uh, send me some sort of a message which will tell me what server it is and what uh, software it, it is running right so if i do that um, it sort of tells me um, message 20, 220, uh, the actual um, server address, uh, what sort of protocol I'm dealing with and what software they run. So it's apparently running Ubuntu and it's running Postfix, right? So then I can initiate myself by saying hello and my, um, you know, my server name. So I can kind of fake, fake it and paste it. And then when I send it, it says, okay, 250, it's fine. Um, I kind of, I know who you are. I registered you as this, this thing. And then I can actually send mail. So using the SMTP, I can prepare a, a message and send it through this gateway. Um, the, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna follow this, but you can follow it at home and you can sort of actually send mail through um, the, the uh, NT, N, uh, um, NTNU gateway as long as you are connected to NTNU network, right? So because I'm not connected, chances are if I try to follow this, it will say, okay, you have to, you, you know, you, we will not send mail through a, a gate, uh, through you, uh, which we don't know. Uh, but if I connect it through um, NTNU VPN and set my IP address, which would be the IP address, which I'm actually using and initiate this communication like this, then I could send the mail because all um, NTNU internal um, IP addresses are allowed to send mail, right? We can do some, uh, some other things. So uh, to quit, I need to use this. Uh, so I can uh, connect to my local machine on port um, local host on port 8888, okay? Uh, and it says, no, you cannot connect because the port is not open. Uh, so it's trying to connect to this port, uh, but um, the port is closed, so no communication can happen. So if I open this other window and I say NC, and I say I want a listening on a local host port 8888. So now I'm opening a server on port 8888, which listens for connections. And it will basically print uh, whatever comes in to standard output. That's what cutting means. Like cut is a pipe which takes some data in and uh, feeds it into the uh, standard um, output. 
So if I do that, then I have a server. Uh, I have a server waiting here for somebody to connect and send something to it, right? So what I can do is I can use Telnet now to connect connect to this 8888 port and it opened the connection. It Previously, it couldn't open the connection because the port was closed. Now it could open the connection and I can close the connection by control square bracket. Um, and whatever I sent to the server, so I can, I can say this, uh, hello, I am here. Um, and as you see, it shows up on the other side of the pipe now. So what happened here? I opened a client socket to port 8888. And on my end, I have some random port, which is my end of communication. I don't know what my port is, but I do have a port which this socket is using. And this port is used to feed data to the other end, the other socket end. Um, and that happens. Uh, when I, I type something here. So on that end, what I did, I opened a server socket, which is listening on connections on port 8888. This connection happened initially, right? So let's, let's re, uh, yeah, so I need to close the connection. So I closed the connection and then NCAT store stopped as well. So if I open the connection again, now, what happened here is I opened a server socket which listens on port 8888. Now I connect to this socket and now I created a client socket with random port which talked to this port 8888 and this server set up a new random port which connected this end connection to the standard output to feed the data out and is and gave me the kind of the handshake, which now I can use to get those two sockets to connect. So now if I um, type something here, it goes to this socket and it's printed to the standard output. And from the client, if I type something here, I have this client socket sending the text to this one and that one printing it out. So standard input and output from my two terminals are now used as the endpoints of the socket and the socket is used to transfer the data back and forth, right? So that's what sockets are. They are basically an easy way for connecting to a particular port and address over the TCP IP stack um, to communicate between two endpoints. And the server one is needed to initiate the initial handshake. So I cannot connect to the port here without this port being open. And to open this port, I need the server socket. So this is pretty cool. You can, um, you can connect to all well-known, um, I always press control C, but you have to press control square bracket because control C is transmit it over to the client side as well, right? So now if I type anything here, nothing happens because I already quit the, uh, um, yeah, so if I quit, this closes both uh, my connection and the server. Normally that doesn't like, if I connect it to NTNU gateway and I closed it, the NTNU gateway still sits there, right? It's still open. Uh, I can tell net to my port 22, um, connection refused. I can tell net to our git, um, git yovik imt and tnu and all, port 22, um, no, I, I, ed. Yeah, so now you can see I actually connected to the SSH server and I can have an SSH session with the server if I knew what type of uh, commands and protocol SSH is based on, right? Um, 
So I will quit that. Um, I can connect, I can try to connect to um, port 25, but port 25 on our GitLab is closed. We don't run a mail server. We use the university mail server. So it's gonna be trying, but it's not able to connect. And I can use NCAT as well. So if you connect to NCAT, okay, so let's see. I open a server here and I connect to a local host 8888 again. And now I basically have the same as with the telnet. So this worked basically the same as telnet, it just didn't follow the telnet protocol. It didn't follow any protocol. It just opened a row socket, right? Before you could see some, uh, when I opened the telnet connection, you can see some handshake happening between the client and the server because the client sent some uh, initial um, telnet uh, stuff, but this one doesn't send anything. So everything is raw. So if I type stuff now, you know, it, it works both ways uh, from server, but I use the netcat to kind of achieve the same thing. All right, so to close netcat, you press control C. Uh, to close telnet, you press control square bracket. All right, so let's continue. So we, uh, we know, you know how to use sockets. And if we set up um, a server socket in software, so if we write your own Kotlin or Java code uh, and open a socket on, on using a server socket, we could use netcat uh, to, to test it, right? Uh, you don't need to write client and server. You can just write server and use netcat or telnet to test your server implementation. So we will need this to write our chat because we need, like th this was a basic chat, right? It was kind of a basic chat between two nodes uh, and we will need similar functionality um, to establish chat between two devices. So we will have to use a client and server side sockets um, to establish the communication. Because we're gonna use some higher level APIs on Android, uh, this sometimes is a, is a little bit hidden from you. So you don't need to deal with ports or addresses directly. You will need with uh, readers and writers, with IO streams, right? Th this is nothing else than IO stream, which is bit with the uh, writer on that end and the reader on that end and vice versa to pass the messages between the two windows. Um, so there is no real tutorial uh, how to use sockets, but we can look up the Java API or Kotlin API, how to open a server socket and how to, how to use them. So if I um, kind of open the server one, uh, you will see that I have um, uh, simple constructors which initiate us um, like this one initiates, um, a uh, instantiates a socket bound to a particular port. Uh, and then you can also do that on a particular address. Usually when you initiate um, a socket on a port, it will open the connection on all the interfaces that you have. And if you want to limit it, you have to say, okay, which local IP address you want to bound bind the port to such that it will only work on this particular address. Uh, so, you know, what is the difference? Like, well, the difference is that you, when you're using a server or if you're using your laptop, you have a large number of uh, addresses that you use. So, for example, on my end, I have, a really long list of interfaces uh, which I'm using, one of which is 127.0.0.1, which is a local host. It's the same with the um, IPv6, right? So my local host on IPv6 
and my local host on IPv4 are the ones which I usually want to test. If I'm testing something and I use this constructor, it will open on all my interfaces, including the public ones. So in theory, I will expose myself to potential attacks from outside uh, if I'm doing it on the server, because suddenly my, my particular port is open and my application is vulnerable to connections from outside of my local machine. Uh, so we, we usually use this one um, because we want to be specific for what we want to achieve. Like if we only want to local host, we kind of use this one. And then you, um, once you start it, uh, you have a number of getters and uh, you can check how, how you are configured. Uh, you can in instantiate it and then you can bind it, right? Uh, so usually this is what we, um, when that, you know, that's what happens when, um, I, mean, I mean, you can do it through the in initiation or you can do it through the bind. You, usually you have to call the bind anyway. So um, we use a simple form of initiating with the port and then binding to a particular address. Um, and then uh, you call accept. And once you call accept, uh, you, will, you will see that um, every time this method returns, it returns you a new socket. And this is your kind of client socket. So as I was describing before, the client socket opens the client socket and connects to the server. And then the server accepts the connection and spawns a new socket, which is the other endpoint between the socket to socket communication. Uh, and then you can call accept again to have this port, well-known port available all the time. This new socket will have a new port not the well-known port, it will have some random port. So you will be communicating between a random port on your client side and the random port on the end side. But the initial connection will be through the well-known port. So that's, that's how it works. The client side is simpler. So if we go to slides and open the, the, um, the slides, then uh, this one has basically you know, a constructor same as before, either empty or, or not. And then you have this bind call, which actually binds the, um, the socket to the, like it actually initiates the, um, um, the wiring up. And then you call connect to actually establish the, uh, the connection, right? Um, so you can check, check that out um, later on. Uh, we will need to use this, uh, I mean, we will need to use sockets and IO uh, to communicate. Uh, and then you basically have, on sockets, you have this input stream and output stream. Uh, get, 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 get output, yeah. And this one, which gives you the streams. And then you can wrap it into higher level APIs like readers to send data back and forth. What you send is totally up to you. Those are binary streams. So you can send text, you can send binary data, you can send whatever. So once you open up the connection between the, the two sockets, what you are sending in between is totally up to you. And this is again, what we think on protocols versus APIs it makes much more sense to think about what you're sending in terms of protocol because it's just raw data, right? So you define what headers it has, what order it should be in, what encoding it will use, whatever. And it's more natural to think about it as in, in terms of protocol rather than an API because it's just raw by bytes, raw, raw data being passed. Uh, and for our chat, we will need this. We will need some form of messaging uh, which identifies what it is. Is it a message? Is it a message being to, to forward to somebody else? What it is? We can start with a very simple protocol which is completely empty like we did here, which basically sends a text between the two nodes and then this text is displayed to the user and that's it. 
uh, but that might not be sufficient for routing messages or that might not be sufficient for more complex uh, scenarios within our, our application. All right. So we, <coughs> we kind of uh, covered the, the networking and the sockets and we will talk about NSD, but let's have a um, short break. So it's, I, I talked for all, almost an hour. Uh, so let's have a break. Um, Ten minutes. So I'll, I'll be back in 10 minutes, which is uh, 21 past 11. All right. Is sound working? Can you see the screen and sound is all, all good? Great. Yes. Okay, thanks. All right, so what we did, we sort of revised a little bit the networking stack. We discussed how to use sockets, like on the abstract level, and what they offer us. And now we would like to play with um, with the actual, um, okay, so there are uh, two services which are offered in Android for discovering nearby devices. The first one is called network service discovery. Well, why, why does it exist? It's, it's a very um, simple thing because you would like to have services which are easily discoverable uh, within the local network, such as local printers or local webcams, which are not necessarily available outside of the local network, but are kind of in, you know, in a, a local, um, offer services to local devices. So you can have a number of different local services <clears throat> being offered through NSD. And NSD is using a kind of a DNS SD, which stands for a service discovery. And service discovery is cross-platform. So this is kind of a very nice, easy cross-platform mechanism, which allows us to uh, offer a service um, through our application which can then be used by other applications, right? So if you, if we go to the developers portal, they have some uh, explanations of, yeah, let me make it bigger, um, some explanation of what it is, uh, what, what it uses and how you can use it. And they have kind of a snippets, um, you know, uh, demo scenarios of how how it works. And in fact, they use a chat as a, as a mechanism for registering a service, right? So you can register your app, register a service which offers some sort of chat functionality. And as you see, we have to define on which port this um, service works. And the type is just a human readable name of, of what that service is, right? So we have kind of a, uh, a descriptive name and the type of the port which we're using. Um, and this becomes a de facto well-known port for our chat, right? And then they go on and kind of show it. Uh, and as you, you, you can see, you basically have to set up yourself a server socket uh, and then when the connection comes, you have to kind of uh, handle the incoming connections and do something with it. So that, that's what I was discussing yes, um, a minute ago about using the 
the socket API, right? So we will need to use the socket APIs uh, to obtain um, the input and output ports, uh, input and output streams, such that we can pass data, right? Uh, for the chat, it can be very stream, uh, you know, simple just by passing text. Um, but for some more complicated things, we kind of interact with the with the servers, uh, with the sockets. So here on the server socket side, we kind of uh, you know initiate initiate the socket. Uh, we have a callback which handles what to do when the connection comes, and then we handle kind of a, a bit of a uh, service lifecycle. Um, and then we have um, the, on the client side, we kind of uh, do similar thing, but we uh, request the um, discovery services to provide us callback when they discover this chat service being around, right? So they kind of, the tutorial here gives a kind of a both client and server site without the actual chat itself, right? So they, they um, offer this sort of uh, idea, but they don't implement the actual chat functionality itself. So as a homework uh, for, for the socket thing here, Let's add homework. Um, so it will have two, two phases. So phase one is simple Kotlin or Java server client chat um, like functionality. Uh, that should not be very hard. You basically have to open a socket on a particular port on a server side and um, uh, wire up the in input output from the, from the um, standard input and standard output to the stream and the same on the client. And then you can have basically an equivalent of NCAT network, NETCAT uh, to pipe messages, right? Uh, so that's, I don't know, it, it will be about 30 lines of code, um, maybe 40, like 20 on each side. Uh, and then phase two is a little bit more fun, is integrate, integrate your phase one code with NSD. So then you could reuse the code which um, they provided here, to basically have a discovery and have it actually working. So if you substitute that with your code, then um, this, this will basically work. So you will have to implement the, uh, the handling of the messages and, and so on. Not, um, not super hard. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Um, why do we talk about NSD at all? Well, I already kind of spoiled the, uh, the fun because NSD offers us a very simple chat service, like it's out of the box. We could reuse the code which the Android developer site has. We could formulate, uh, sorry, we could formulate our standard service as a kind of a chat service, advertise it to our local network and um, search for other apps advertising the same service, connect to them, and you know, you use sockets to communicate and basically chat, right? So you might think, well, then we are done, right? Um, well, yes, we are done with the basics. So basics are done. But there are some, some things to consider. So as you, as you know, if you look at this um, service registration uh, and the registration, uh, you will notice that, um, yeah, so 
one of the section is and register your service on application close, right? So in this demo, when your application is actually closed, the service that the application was offering is closed also. And that begs a question like, okay, if I quit my chat, nobody can send messages to me and I cannot chat anymore. Like I will not get messages from my uh, surrounding devices because I quit the app. Is that behavior um, desirable? Well, for the chat application, it's not. So even if I'm not using the app and someone wants to message me, I should still get this message, right? So that means, should I run my service as an Android background service in the background? Probably yes. So what does it mean? So how can I combine this service now with the client capabilities when I'm actually typing messages and <clears throat> connecting to, to other uh, neighboring devices to send messages? So how, how to architect it, how, how to split it? So we've discussed it before that the model will have to have two sort of modes uh, and the background service probably is, um, need, needs to run in the background. So in the background, I have the app running all the time and accepting incoming connections to allow some new nodes to connect to me and also offer some routing uh, functionality and also offer the inbox capabilities, right? So if someone is messaging me, I should get those messages and I should get some notification, right? So it's, um, you know, notification management, notification management, uh, background service management, and so on. Um, yeah, so, I spelling, spelling. So there are some issues still to consider and those are not done by the uh, NSD those are done by us, by you designing the application. So even though NSD offers us, you know, a very basic architecture for wrapping up our logic into a service, um, kind of a network service in a sense, right? So as a network service, and then using DNS, as the discovery for that service. Um, there is still a lot of details to kind of work out and those actually make the app what it is. And that's why we're doing the whole exercise, right? So this is one, one problem. There is another problem. Um, the other problem is that NSD runs on a managed network. So, which is um, advantage and disadvantaged, right? So uh, let's call it normal Wi-Fi network. So, but it has some implications. So for example, the devices that can use it will have to be connected to a, an access point, right? So, Um, it might be okay, but it might not be desirable. So there is additional mode apart from NSD. So when I, when we had this slide, I said there are two ways of connecting to local devices nearby. One of them is NSD and we sort of covered it, um, covered the basics and it offers kind of a nice cross platform discovery and it offers this kind of a nice architecture for the for wrapping up the services but it has some some drawbacks so there is a second way for uh, connecting local devices and it's called wi-fi direct or peer-to-peer -peer mode so this is when the devices are not connected to any access point and we don't have internet right um so this 
allows us to connect to devices which are not on the internet, which are not connected to internet, which are not connected to any of the Wi-Fi access points. Um, so it's kind of visually, you can kind of uh, imagine that if you're, if you're on a desert or a deserted island, you have a bunch of friends, there is no internet, but you can still create a network. So we often have um, this situation where the, when disaster happens. So if you have flooding or earthquake, um, it may happen that there is no infrastructure, there is no powers anymore, and you cannot connect to the internet, then this peer-to-peer -peer mode, this Wi-Fi direct mode is the only way you could work with the, with the network infrastructure. The other way is that, you know, the network infrastructure is managed by network operators. And in most countries, that's fine. Uh, in Norway, it's fine. But in some countries, this um, is used as a censorship device. So in, in some countries, people cannot send um, or access certain services because there is a strong censorship of what sort of traffic is allowed on the network and what's not allowed. Um, so it might be good idea for those situations to have a censorship resistance system, which is independent of anybody being in charge of the infrastructure. And that's where this peer-to-peer -peer mode also comes into play because I can connect to a device which is local to me, but nobody can stop me doing that. Then that means I have more freedom and I have more censorship resistance. So in some situations, this Wi-Fi direct or P2P mode might be kind of a much more desirable. So how does that work? Well, it's, a little bit more complex, right? So it, it has a lot of characteristics of this one um, because we have to advertise something, it has to be discovered, and then we have to connect. Um, but unlike network service discovery, which is more of a client server uh, situation, in peer-to-peer Wi-Fi direct mode, we have more of a peer-to-peer -peer situation. So we want to discover who is next to us, but not necessarily it will be just one node. It can be multiple, right? So we have this concept of a group. Uh, what, what group is? Well, group is the, uh, all the devices which are kind of forming the peer-to-peer -peer network locally, right? So if I have a device, and there are five other students or uh, flatmates or whoever around with their devices, we have kind of a peer-to-peer -peer network of six devices, right? Um, and then that creates sort of um, a, a group or a hub. So it doesn't need to be that, uh, let's say I have Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and we have three devices, and it doesn't need to be that Alice can see Charlie device. It's sufficient if Alice can see Bob device and Bob device can see Charlie, all three devices will form this kind of group. They will form this um, network of, th this peer-to-peer -peer network, but it will be kind of local. It will be local to a flat. So let's say we have a class uh, at NTNU with uh, 30 students and all those 30 devices form a peer-to-peer -peer network. And then there are like uh, five students somewhere um, outside or somewhere in the flat, which form their own peer-to-peer -peer network. Those two networks are not connected, right? So we have kind of a con concept of a group which is used for legacy mode, like um, Android uses the, the concept of a group slightly differently, like to what I said, and they kind of use this, this concept of Wi-Fi direct network, which is this network of peer-to-peer. -peer. It is a peer-to-peer -peer network, but it's local. Um, and then we have this concept of peer-to-peer -peer network kind of more global, uh, which allows a disconnected smaller peer-to-peer -peer networks to be talking to each other. And that's what we need, this concept of relay or bridge, which, um, allows a connectivity between those uh, isolated islands of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, connectivity. 
Uh, so this relay bridge um, needs to be done somehow, right? So um, how this can be achieved? Well, that, that's an open question. Uh, for this implementation, for this course, we don't kind of deal with this, but you could think of, for example, one of the devices being connected to internet and using internet to hop to another isolated uh, network. But then this other network would need to have internet connectivity as well. This model is very typical for uh, <clears throat> IoT devices, right? So IoT devices, they have local, not internet-based uh, connectivity. So all the sensors, they don't have internet, but they communicate between themselves and between the base station. And then um, the base station, um, so local not internet-based connectivity between IoT devices. Let's spell it nicely. Yeah. But base station has internet access. And it can work as a as a kind of this bridge delay uh, relay uh, mechanism. Um, you could have something else. So when I was uh, working at Otago, we did have a project um, designed to work in disaster situations. So let me just check this disaster thing. Yeah. So in disaster situations you have no infrastructure and you have no internet. So then imagine that you have um, two cities, you have Lillehammer and Jovik, and within Jovik, we managed to get a nice peer-to-peer -peer network using Wi-Fi Direct. So we have enough density that in the city center, everybody who is kind of around the city center can fire up the app and has a kind of a, is part of the Jovik peer-to-peer -peer network. So we can chat with each other and we can um, use this kind of a local area network which we created. And the same happened in Lillehammer, right? But between us and Lillehammer, uh, people don't are uh, connected because the range is too, too large. Those are two separate P2P networks. But we have a lot of traffic going on between Jovik and Lillehammer. There are taxi drivers, there are bus drivers, there are um, you know, uh, private cars going there. So what we can do is we can have a mechanism which stores certain messages in kind of like a inbox and all messages which are initiated in Jovik but their uh, destination network is Lillehammer, they are stored in this kind of storage. And then if a bus or if a car was using the client site on in Jovik but traveled to Lillehammer, then it can offer those messages to the Lillehammer network. So it will be slow. It will not be real time, of course, because the packets or the messages will need to physically travel with the bus drivers or with the taxi drivers between the cities. But because it happens multiple times a day, we can have a kind of a communication network where we can sort of chat with the Lillehammer people. It will be, as I'm saying, not real time. It will be delayed. And the delay is a little bit unpredictable. It depends like who goes there, right? Um, and, and when. But there are some um, uh, communication protocols which are called um, long delay network protocols. Uh, let me just make it a little bit smaller. Yeah, so we have delay tolerant networks. Um, yeah, so if I say
Yeah, maybe. Maybe this one has. There were some experiments done in some very rural areas in third world countries where this type of messaging or this type of uh, long delay network ha has been deployed and has been used. It is also used for uh, uh, communication between entities which are kind of um, using space um, travel or space missions. Um, so you can kind of read more about this and you can read how uh, various routing mechanisms are used and how you can kind of do this. Um, so the basically what we want is we want a network protocol which allows us to send messages which can be delivered by physical means by you know pigeon or a car uh, to a different location but still allow us to communicate digitally uh, and they are robust enough that they deal with the redundancy and with the long delays. Um, so those are kind of a disruption tolerant um, networks or networks which are used for, uh, as I was saying, disaster situations. So in a disaster situation, we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the connectivity, but by physical movement, we can kind of uh, simulate the movement of the packets and make the digital infrastructure kind of work. Um, this is not very different to the way early days internet worked actually. So in the early days uh, when I was using internet, I had to dial in to an internet provider. So I had uh, a modem and I had to dial in. I had to download all the messages and everything to my local machine and then I disconnected. And then I was reading it. Um, I was not using IMAP protocol for reading mail, I was using POP and POP3 uh, to get all the copies, everything on my local machine. And then you write emails, and then uh, my father wrote emails and so on. And then at some point we connected and we sent everything to the network. And then we disconnected again. And then nothing would happen until we connect again and then we would download what were the responses or whatever right so there was no real-time chatting there was no real-time sort of situation i mean you could have it on a very short te temporal basis but basically we were dealing with those long delays um it is different than you know driving the car to lillehammer to get the messages in but it's just the idea right so if you can use those kind of uh, delay tolerant networking, you can also bridge that, you know, um, because here we have the concept of global P2P network, like, you know, an internet, right? Internet P2P. versus uh, a local P2P network. And so we could use other mechanisms, right? You could use, um, even within Jovic, we will have suburbs which lost their connectivity or got uh, partitioned. So let's say you went to campus and on campus we have, you know, uh, 2000 students forming this P2P network. But the moment you go to your flat, maybe this network doesn't cover you. Maybe you are part of another small network. So then you, you will need to use some sort of a relay or bridge to bridge the, the two networks. Um, we could use alternative protocols. You could use Bluetooth. Uh, you could use, um, you know, NSD or other um, mechanisms to bridge the different networks together. So that's, you know, that's how internet works also. Like, um, internet is a collection of large number of individual networks which are connected with each other. 
it's, it, it, it forms this giant single network, but in fact, it, it is kind of a large correction of, of network. So it's the same here. So how, how to achieve a global P2P network, um, kind of equivalent of internet uh, out of a collection of local P2P networks. All right, so then we go to this one. And this one describes how to work with Wi-Fi Direct. Um, Wi-Fi Direct supports WPA2 also, so you can make it secure. Um, they say Android doesn't support ad hoc mode, but it's okay. You can sort of uh, use the uh, Wi-Fi Direct mechanisms to achieve equivalent of an ad hoc mode. Uh, and then again, they have kind of, um, um, you know, a tutorial of how to set this up and how to initiate it. Um, there are basically, um, on, on high level, there are two concepts. So you have this concept of the manager uh, or the kind of a group, group owner. And then you have this concept of, um, of peers. Um, so you can connect to any of the peers, but out of the P2P network, one device is special because it works as a sort of a central coordinator for the messaging and routing within the peer-to-peer -peer network. So because of that, um, there is a mechanism for deciding who that node is and then if one if that particular node goes out of the network then it needs to another device needs to be elected to to work as this node so there is a little bit of a management to generate the peer-to-peer uh, -peer connectivity and routing within this local area network which is managed by the library and by the api so if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, tutorial, you will notice that there is a certain amount of boilerplate which has to do with the P2P state management and P2P peers state management because you know you need to know if someone comes in and if someone goes out of this network. Uh, within the network, you can talk to anybody directly in kind of a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Of course, with this example, I told you like Alice, Charlie, um, Alice, uh, Bob, Charlie, if Alice doesn't see Charlie, she can still communicate with uh, him through Bob. But Bob will be kind of um, um, agnostic about this. So th this will kind of happen beneath the, beneath the surface. Uh, and if you're using encryption, you know, things will be kind of relatively say, secure. Um, and it offers um, broadcasts, it offers peer-to-peer uh, -peer messaging, it offers different kind of handling of peer discovery and so on and so forth. So you can kind of check it out. It's, um, it's yeah, pretty straightforward as well. And then once you do that, you can, um, you can f basically, you, using this, you can create um, the same chat um, um, uh, demo that we were discussing for doing with NSD, right? So instead of using NSD, but the code will be kind of the same, the, the, um, um, the chat code uh, with, the, uh, with the sockets. Um, you will just use slightly different mechanisms for managing the, the state and the network. And you can have a very simple peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, demo if you kind of follow this, uh, this tutorial as well. So what I'm suggesting uh, for, yeah, let me just go to this homework thing. Yeah, so first start without Android, just do Kotlin uh, or Java, just uh, client server, because this is the core. Uh, the core is needed no matter what. 
Uh, then integrate your phase one code core with NSD and then phase three integrate your code with um, Wi-Fi direct. And I will do also, I will do this as well. So um, the code will be posted to it, the repo of the course for people to have a look as an example. So if you don't want to do that, um, I expect you to at least check the code from the repository. But for, yeah, for you to learn more about it, do this. You don't need to do all three. If you just do the first one, that's you know fine because you will learn about uh, sockets and basic uh, I/O, basic streams. Um, once you have this, those two are easy because you just need to copy and paste from the uh, from the tutorial. So this is just basically taking the tutorial code and copying and pasting it to your application. So you don't really need to do a lot of coding. You just need to kind of understand what is happening and how to reuse it. Um, and uh, as I said, I will kind of do that as well in Kotlin, so you can have kind of a streamlined um, version of it. All right, so I will link this. Um, so this is um, Wi-Fi Direct and NSD. Refresher. So I will link the slides to uh, to our wiki page. Um, okay, so everyone. Any questions? So 20th. So we had, so Tuesday 14th April, we had the review. Today is of April fourteen. I will, uh, I will also put the recording in here once we finish. Um, yeah, questions. Bjornar first. I will stop recording.